appreciate everyone uh, that's here tonight for the uh, lesson, <clears throat> for the uh, uh, Bible lesson. We left off last time at Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 30. So that's, that's where we'll start. <clears throat> Before we do, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Just bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, bless this study of ours where we delve into the riches of thy word. We're grateful for the power that it has in our lives and for the power that it has in the lives of others as we learn it and live it. So we're grateful for the study, grateful for those writers of old that left these important messages for us to guide us through this life and on to into the next. We thank you for Jesus and whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> It says uh, there in verse uh, 30, it says, uh, for we know him, and we know, that means we know the character and attributes of God, and we know from that that he must uh, act according to his nature. He can't deny himself. So he, we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So vengeance does not belong to us, but it belongs to God. And uh, that's cited from uh, Deuteronomy 32nd chapter, verse 35. And it's also in uh, Romans 12, 19. <clears throat> so it says that the uh, Lord, uh, I will replace his Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And if we look at that uh, 36th verse of Deuteronomy 32, it, it says, uh, and have compassion on them that is righteous judgment you might look at uh, Romans 132 and Romans 2 verse 5 and also 2 Thessalonians uh, 1 verse 5 <clears throat> and this vengeance belongs to me is going to be according to God's, God's uh, timetable not according to our timetable you know, a lot of times we get impatient and want things done now, but that's not the way God works. But uh, God will avenge his people. It says in that uh, Deuteronomy 32nd chapter, verse uh, 35 to 36, it says, vengeance is mine. Again, I say it's cited again in the Romans. Vengeance is mine and recompense. Now, their foot shall slip in due time. So, you know, that's God's timetable. <clears throat> for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things to come hasten upon them for the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is going and, and uh, there is no one remaining bond or free <clears throat> we read in uh, verse 31 it says it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God you know, fearful may be an awesome thing or it may be something to be really afraid of. But to fall in the hands of God for the purposes of correction is uh, good. But to fall in the hands of God as an apostate has got to be pretty awful. <clears throat> like David uh, in 2 Samuel 24, 14, you remember he was uh, guilty of the sin of numbering the people. Uh, sinful because God told him not to do it, but he did it anyway. So as punishment, God gave him three choices. <clears throat> but David said there, said to Gad, and that was the one that delivered the message to David. He says, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall in the hand of man. <clears throat> but if you're talking about the unrepentant uh, apostate, you know, we can look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of, of his power. Jesus uh, said in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 46, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So it's, 
it's uh, can be good to fall in the hands of God. It can be bad based upon one's uh, spiritual condition. In the 32nd verse of chapter 10, <clears throat> it says, but, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, that is translated from the kingdom of darkness in the kingdom of light, you know, they become Christians. So you endured a great struggle with sufferings and, <clears throat> and indeed the Hebrew Christians being in Jerusalem where the, uh, the Jews still, uh, as David said, still went to the temple. And we know they're persecuted because when the uh, gospel preached, we all remember Stephen's martyrdom. So they think during a great struggle with uh, suffering. <clears throat> In verse uh, 33, it said, partly while you were made a spectacle, spectacle, spectacle is a public ridicule. I think in the King James Version, it says gazing stock stock that someone gazes upon. See, you were made a spectacle both by reproaches, that's uh, aspersions and epithets, and uh, tribulations, that's uh, various sufferings and persecutions uh, endured by the people. And partly why you became companions of those who were so treated, even when they were not the uh, subject of spectacle reproach or tribulation, uh, they helped those people who were the subject of those things. So they had borne these uh, things with uh, patience and fortitude. In the 34, fourth verse, it says, for you had compassion on me and my chains. Uh, they sympathize with those and whoever this writer is, they sympathize with those who also suffered <clears throat> and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. So the losses, the material losses they sustained when, uh, as a Jew, they became a Christian. Yeah, you, know, you might think of um, what would happen today when a Muslim becomes a Christian, they, they lose everything. That was what was happening back in that time. Said, and joyfully accept the plundering of your goods, knowing that you had a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So they had an, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and one that does not fade away, uh, reserved in heaven. First Peter, the first chapter, verse four. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, Acts 5.41. It says in verse 35, therefore, do not cast away your confidence. But don't throw away your confidence as a, say, a cowardly soldier that uh, at that time would throw away his shield and flee from the field of battle, flee, flee from the enemy. Don't, don't do that. Put yourselves like men, as we read in 1 Samuel. Four verse nine. <clears throat> Watch, stand fast in the faith, and be brave, be strong. First Corinthians, sixteenth chapter, verse thirteen. It says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Well, the greatest reward, of course, is salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and, and faith in that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God. Ephesians, two verse eight. <clears throat> Verse 36, it says, for you have need of endurance. And this kind of endurance is patience. Uh, without this endurance, and God's chastisements are mere uh, irritants. You might uh, read uh, Romans 5th chapter, verse three through five. We won't read that here. Well, maybe we will. <clears throat> Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. And, and knowing that tribulations produces perseverance and perseverance character and so forth and so on. Uh, so tribulations serve their pers a purpose, but we must endure 
with patience. It says, so after that, after you have done the will of God, see, if they must suffer in order to do God's will, <clears throat> you may receive the promise. Well, the promise is eternal life. You know, that it, that uh, city that uh, in the heavens, the uh, house not made with hands. So eternal life is, uh, for example, Abraham, after he had patiently endured, he endured uh, the promise, and we'll get into that more in chapter 11. But that's, so you might refer again to Hebrews, the sixth six chapter, verse 15. In the 37th uh, verse of Hebrews, he sa it says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. <clears throat> And as we read before, so much more as you see today are approaching. His coming in providence to destroy Jerusalem and thereby deliver the Hebrew Christians from further persecution by the hand of the Jews is was something to be, you know, the, the uh, Hebrew Christian may not have known about it, but it was something that delivered them from all this persecution. So God uh, would uh, come and execute his purposes at the appointed time, <clears throat> not according to our time. Upon the fall of Jerusalem, the uh, unbelieving Jews were all slain or taken captive. But if the historians are accurate, uh, no Christian is known to have perished in its destruction. I think that's very plausible since Christians were warned ahead of time of the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem. So very pl plausible that no one, no Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Verse 38, it uh, reads, now the just shall live by faith. Just, just shall live eternally because of his faith. Uh, living by faith will make one just. So you could say it by that that way. But if anyone, that's, you know, the just man that was mentioned just uh, above, if he draws back, that is, if he apostatizes, uh, my soul has no pleasure in him. God is unable to save the one who apostatizes. He can't save him because do so would go against his nature. So he, his, uh, God has no pleasure in him. <clears throat> in verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now this is just a uh, uh, literary technique of where the writer identifies with the audience and it's uh, it, it, it's to achieve some sort of connection in order to encourage them to do uh, do right so the, the other author identifies with this reader as a means of encouraging him he says uh, we are not of the first part those who draw back to perdition but we are of the second part, those who believe to the saving of the soul. So he makes the uh, saving of the soul the theming, uh, theme of the uh, following section. And it says in Hebrews 11, chapter verse 1, <clears throat> Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We all know that. And a lot of times, it's, if someone wants to say, what's the definition of faith, we will quote this. But this is not a definition of faith. Uh, but rather, it's, it's intended to describe faith as it um, let's say animates man as a means of endurance and a principle of enjoyment. This verse and the uh, many examples that follow in, in chapter 11 
show that uh, faith had been the motivating power for all the, of God's people under the patriarchal and the mosaical systems. And so it is under the Christian age. The confidence and assurance that we call faith is not just an abstract feeling of belief or an acceptance, but one of genuine proof and evidence. It is a steadiness of mind, firmness and resolution when tempted, a conviction of trust and a stay the course confidence. Genuine faith is an absolute necessity towards our understanding of God. Faith in, involves belief, but belief alone is not faith. For in James uh, second chapter verse 19 is the statement, even the devils believe and tremble. Yet uh, I don't think there's any one of us that, that would assert that the devils have a saving faith. Today has, has always been the case, I suppose, uh, many believe in a deity of some sort, uh, yet render no obedience to that deity. Yet saving faith includes as an essential element, obedience to the eternal God and his Christ. Obedience is motivated by trust in the promises of God, uh, an assurance that God will keep his promises, and an absolute hope that is a looking forward to and an expectation of the things promised. Of course, primarily that's salvation. When belief in God becomes faith, it gives that firm foundation on which to stand and the strength of character and determination to endure without wavering uh, through all the trials and tribulations that life and flesh will throw at us. Faith is that sustaining power which enables the faithful to anticipate as a present reality, that is, the substance of the things hoped for, particularly the blessings of eternity to come. That's what we uh, hope for. Believing the word of God to be God-breathed and therefore infallible and immutable, faith becomes a positive reality, driving us in perfect trust and confidence to render strict obedience to God Almighty. The clause, the evidence of things not seen is a sort of constructive Hebrew parallelism. The evidence involves proof by which uh, one a proposition is demonstrated to be true or false and the resulting conviction brought about by this demonstration. The hope for a phrase envisages a future attainment. The things not seen embrace all the invisible realities of the universe, past, present, and future. For example, the first 12 chapters of Genesis has to do with the creation of the world and subsequent catastrophic events, primarily the flood. There is a thing uh, no one here has seen. Nobody was there during the creation. Well, do you believe it? Faith is its evidence. It says in John, the fifth chapter, verses 28 through 29, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. <clears throat> Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. This is a future thing. No one here has seen that. Do you believe it? Well, faith is its evidence. The mosaical system was one of works, yet the examples presented in chapter 11 show clearly that it was works that demonstrated their faith. Faith cannot exist merely as a theoretical concept. It must give rise to action. You don't call it works, it must give rise, uh, uh, rise to works. In the chapter, James chapter two, verse 14, which we mentioned up there, it says, this also faith by itself, 
if it doesn't have how does not have works is dead. <clears throat> and it says in uh, verse uh, 18 or 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. In verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect? And then down in 26, whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now we uh, preach, and I think rightly so, because the Bible teaches it, that uh, faith must be accompanied by works or, or it's a dead faith. But what we don't uh, mention as often, even though we do uh, teach it, uh, even though works without faith is dead, so a faith without works is just as dead. So uh, works, or maybe I should say uh, works, uh, works without faith is vain, let's say vain works, but really it's just as dead as the faith without works. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 21 through 23, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? So they did many works, no doubt about that, but uh, Jesus will say, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, because they had no faith. They had an incorrect faith. In uh, Romans 10, uh, chapter verse 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So faith must be uh, derived on the uh, testimony of the word of God. That's where one gains faith. There can be no faith without this testimony. When God speaks it, that is the end of all controversy to, to the believer, and we'll see that throughout chapter 11. The Christian receives it, uh, believes it, and acts in harmony with it with all confidence. And well, why did he do this? Simply because God says so. That is saving faith. In verse 2, it says, for by it, that, that's the uh, faith that's was spoken of above, the elders had uh, obtained a good testimony. Uh, the good testimony will be given in part in the following verses throughout uh, chapter 11. These worthies of old are given as examples, not for their wealth, their talents, their learning, or their secular attainments, but because of their faith. They set their mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. We, we, we'll read that later on in verse 13. In verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds, that's the whole material universe, were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are uh, visible. I thought it was interesting that the first pictures of the James Webb, Webb telescope came out where According to them, show the uh, the farthest images from Earth has been ever seen, and then, best I recall, there are only two stars in that image, and that's from our own galaxy. All the other points of light were galaxies. There are thousands of them, so this is a really a big universe. But it was all uh, created by the Word of God. Now, these are uh, examples of the things not seen of uh, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The uh, created universe 
did not come from some previously existing material, but came ex nihilo. All the ancient philosophers, philosophers from Thales to Aristotle always had something coming from something. Therefore, matter, according to their philosophy, had to be eternal. And evolutionists are still stuck in that way of thinking because they've got to have something to from which things evolved. <clears throat> but according to uh, in Genesis 1 1, even the material things were created by the eternal word of God. He did not make the uh, uh, universe out of pre existing material. Uh, but he just merely spoke and the base materials that we now use and the finished product, they all came into existence. In verse four, uh, and we should keep in mind that the worthies of old, uh, given as examples of faith, never had what we have, that is a completed revelation of the plan of salvation. In First Peter one, chapter one, verses ten through thirteen, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And we'll get into this later about. What did the uh, worthy suppose actually know? To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering things which now have been reported to you through those things, who, uh, those, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard it uh, said, and I'm sure some of you have also, that it, uh, it'd be nice to live back in the time of Christ. I would say that, uh, you know, when they say that, that sentiment may be genuine, but we need to remember that if we walk with Jesus, he would have said the same things contained in the divine volume we now have. And we have the advantage of being able to look back at the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. And if there's anything you want to ask that you would have liked to ask Jesus, well, it's simply all you need to do is live your life by faith and then you can ask uh, Jesus uh, when you get to heaven. Yeah, he'd be sitting on the throne so you can ask him there. Of course, I really doubt that your questions would be all that important at that time. <clears throat> By faith, verse 4, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. He offered it in faith than Cain did. And that's in Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 3 through 5. It said there in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord. So, so he made some sort of sacrifice. Abel also brought uh, the firstborn of his flock and, and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance uh, uh, fell. <clears throat> now, prior to this time, there's nothing said about uh, there must be a uh, offering of flock rather than uh, fruit of the ground. But we know that that was the case because, uh, you know, faith comes by hearing. So they, they had to have heard what was acceptable to God. And nothing is really said about the intrinsic value of the two offerings. It may be that the uh, fruit of the ground was much more valuable than the firstborn of the flock. <clears throat> There's no way of knowing. But we do know that they will offer by faith, you know, Romans 10, 17, he offered it in uh, obedience to God because that's what God said to do. Faith comes by hearing. Abel obeyed, Cain did not. 
We know Samuel said <clears throat> in the first Samuel 15 chapter verse 22, it's uh, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of uh, rams. So Abel's offering was in consequence of his reliance on what God wanted, the word of God, what God told him. Uh, you know, Roman, again, Romans 10, 17. He knew God's will and was determined to do it. Now, of course, Cain made a substitution. And uh, he uh, was disobedient as a result of that. <clears throat> and it says uh, there... Um, through which by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness, and his witness was not his sacrifice, but his faith in offering the sacrifice that was uh, prescribed by God. By doing that, he obtained a witness from God that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, you know, Lord respected Abel and his offering and not Cain. And though he being dead still speaks, he speaks to us by his faith. That is what we learn is to obey God's will come what may. <clears throat> In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, it says by faith Enoch was uh, taken away and King James and ASV says translated. And probably if you look at the uh, uh, at Greek translated is probably a better uh, rendition of the Greek word, but it you know, still has the same idea of being transported to somewhere else. It's a, it really means kind of a change in place or a condition. It's the same word, by the way, used in the, the seventh chapter of Hebrews, verse 12, where it talks about a change of uh, priesthood, a change of law. Both words are the same word used here on the cognate, the word used here. It said, uh, but faith in it was taken away so that he did not see death, that he didn't experience, experience uh, physical death. And it was not found because God had taken him or translated him, if you will. But for before he was taken, he translated, uh, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He, he, and what's not a whole lot is said about uh, Enoch, a lot said here, but uh, in Genesis, the fifth chapter, verse 24, and Enoch, Enoch walked with God. Now, walk means that he, he was uh, righteous, he did what God said to do, and he was not for God took him, and we read in Jude 14 that uh, Enoch was also a prophet, said he was the seventh from, from uh, Abraham, Adam, and he prophesied also, and behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints, that's about all it said about uh, Enoch, but we know that he pleased God, so God took him, he was righteous, so God took him. <clears throat> but without faith, verse 6, for, for without faith it is impossible to please him. Faith, you know, that's the implicit trust in God is essential to please God. It's essential to all work and worship. And work without faith is dead, vain. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists and that he uh, provides these things that he is a rewarder of the blessings of those who dil diligently seek him. So only those who diligently seek him will be rewarded. One does not just accidentally stumble upon the truth. And they doesn't, you know, one doesn't accidentally uh, render obedience. It's, a, it's an active uh, choice and an active uh, decision that one makes. In Romans 8, uh, 
chapter verse 8, it says those that are, that are in the flesh cannot please God. Those are the ones who pursue the uh, pleasures of the flesh, and they don't dil diligently seek, uh, seek God, so they can't please him. In Romans, the 14th chapter, verse uh, 23, it says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he uh, does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. So without faith, you can't please God. And if you don't do anything from faith, that work is sinful. Now, he who comes to God must believe that he is. Now, just to... Uh, why is this so? Well, there was a time when the world didn't exist, only deity. Now, he, he created all things by his own power. Also, he created those things according to the counsel of his own will. He didn't ask anybody. And it was in harmony with his own nature. He can't deny his own nature. Consequently, whatever is in harmony with his will is right. If it's not in harmony with his will, then it's wrong. And any man who acts from any other motive than compliance with God's will is in rebellion to God, even though such, such an action may benefit society in general and may benefit certain individuals in particular. You know, an atheist may uh, do much good that benefits, let's say, the poor, may stock a food kitchen or this, that, the other, and that benefits the poor person. But it doesn't do the, you know, the atheist any good in terms of his eternal list. It, it, you know, it, it's uh, nothing. So no man can act in harmony with God's will unless such actions are from faith in God and his word. So the uh, actions of an atheist, although it may do good for some people, does not do him any good. Therefore, he who would come to God uh, to serve him faithfully must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And it's uh, time is almost uh, up. So I think what I'll do is stop here at uh, Hebrews 11, chapter verse 7, and we'll get into that next week. Thank you for your kind attention.